A couple of videos ago, I brought you down here at the very end of that video, the garden in February, and I showed you a scratch in the ground here at the bottom of our allotment field. And I had said at that time that we were planning on creating a wildlife pond. Well, here it is, phase one is complete. And today I'm gonna to tell you what exactly we've done so far, our next steps, and also what a wildlife pond is and why it is actually quite beneficial to have really near to your vegetable garden. I've walked up the hill and we're now on my plot, so my rented bit of land that I use for extra gardening space, now that I have the home garden. It used to be my main gardening space. And I have beds all around here and I grow everything from perennial berries and fruit and vegetables to potatoes to the garlic that's over here growing right now. And right here in the middle of my vegetable patch, I have a wildlife pond. Now, what is a wildlife pond? It is a pond that you use to attract and provide home to wild animals. And so you don't want to use chemicals in it. You want to build it in a way that it's easy for animals to get in and out of. You want plants in there that will serve as cover and potentially food. And you want lots of plants around the edges too, so that animals have a place to hide. If you have just grass around a pond or it's completely flat, it's not going to be as attractive a home for animals because there's no place for them to hide. So if you put plants around the edges, animals will find your pond. And if you have a pond right now and you've never seen frogs in it before, that could be a reason why. Now, speaking of frogs, they are some of the main animals that I see in my pond. And right now there are clusters of frog spawn right here on the surface. And I've come to expect seeing frog spawn, frog eggs, appear around Valentine's each year. And this year they were about 10 days early. And frog eggs will hatch into tadpoles and other animals will eat tadpoles, but some of them will grow up to become adult frogs. And I have quite a few frogs living on my plot right now. And I, I will come across them through the growing year or when I'm doing a little bit of cleanup and move them aside, but I know that they're here. Since placing the wildlife pond here on my plot, I have seen a massive reduction in the number of large slugs and snails in my veg patch. Now, it might be a coincidence, but I don't think so. Frogs eat slugs and snails. And although I find the small ones, I don't find the really big ones as often. It's as if the frogs are eating the largest ones that they can, and so they don't have a chance to become the big thugs that will decimate an entire plant. So I think that not only am I encouraging and helping the biodiversity here on our site, but it, they are actually helping my garden as well. And ponds will attract not only frogs, but they'll attract bees and pollinating insects. They'll attract dragonflies, which also eat pests as well. So having a wildlife pond isn't just about creating a beautiful place in your garden. It's about helping your veg patch. It's about helping nature and the environment and increasing the biodiversity all around your garden. But they are really beautiful too, aren't they? By this point, I have convinced you that having a wildlife pond in your garden is something to aspire to and perhaps to get on top of right now. Now here at the allotment, there are about 30 people who garden on their own plot and quite a few of us have our own small wildlife ponds. 
And we got to talking at some of our meetings and gatherings and we liked the idea of having something that was much larger. So a much larger pond that everyone could enjoy that would benefit frogs, that would benefit other wildlife here at our site. And we finally got our act together and started work. Can it only be two weeks ago that this was a small hole in the ground? It's incredible how far we've come and still there's a lot of work ahead. Right now it has water in it, but all you can see really aside from that is the black plastic pond liner. We're going to go have a, a closer look at that, but please note that there is phase two coming up and with that the plastic will almost completely disappear and there will be plants and all kinds of, of living things growing around the pond and it will develop over the coming year as well. But in the interim, we can have a look just to kind of see the backbone and the foundation of the pond. The pond liner comes up quite a bit at the moment. The next step after this will be trimming it back and digging it in in places. And we will also be putting materials inside the pond. The pond liner is held up for now with old pavers and stones and anything that can hold it down. It's been very windy. We have another storm coming in later on. And I know from experience on day one that this plastic can really flap around. So if you're planning on building a pond, I would recommend that you find a nice, clear and calm day to do it. Oh, look at that light though. You can really imagine what it's gonna look like when we've got birds and frogs and plants in here as well. Just stunning. Any kind of a water feature really adds life and beauty to a garden. A few of us have worked on this project thus far and the more people you can get, the better and the quicker your pond may be. But you can work on something like this yourself as well. In my pond, my little pond up on my plot, I built completely on my own. So it can be a one person job. You will need a few bits of equipment and materials for a pond though. And first of all, you need tools to be able to dig and to move earth. And that can be as simple as a spade and a wheelbarrow. And once you have the pond dug, you will also need some kind of material to ensure that the water that you fill it with doesn't leak away. And there are different types of materials, but one of the easiest and most accessible is to get a pond liner and also an underlay to put underneath that pond liner as well. And that will help to keep the pond liner from puncturing. I wanna say a huge thank you to Pond Keeper so that's pondkeeper.co.uk and they have donated the materials for our project here at the allotment and that includes the underlay, the liner, a fountain and a pump which we will come to in phase two of this project and we'll talk about that then. The first rule with building a pond is finding a really good site for it and ideally that is going to be flat <laughs> I'm like this behind us and we'll get to that in a second you also should try to keep it in full sun if you can and try to avoid putting it underneath trees especially deciduous trees because all kinds of stuff can fall down so the leaves droppings from birds any kind of organic material that goes into your pond essentially becomes food for algae and bacteria and it can cause more problems than it's worth. So try to situate it a bit further away if possible. Now, if you don't have flat land, it's perfectly possible to build a pond, but you will have to do some extra work. So my little pond that we've just visited, that's on a slope and I built it up using a wooden edge that's still under there, still holding it up. And here we've done something similar, but we've used the earth that we dug out for the pond basin and built up the sides. So finding a level place isn't always going to be easy, but you can in some ways build up and create flat space if you need to. So essentially creating a terrace.
building a pond is relatively easy. You can figure it out. You need to dig a hole, you need to fill it with water, and you've got to make sure that the water doesn't escape. <laughs> there are some intricacies though as well. When you dig out a pond, you want an area that will be relatively deep. And the deepest part of our pond is about three feet deep. And that's just so that wildlife can swim down a bit deeper to escape predators. They can overwinter there as well. Now, those same animals that come into the pond will need a way to get out as well. And so another part of your pond needs to be very shallow. So you need a beach or you need stones built up so that frogs and even small mammals that might fall in can get out of your ponds. It really is a tragedy to see ponds that are dug with straight sides and no way for animals to get out. And it can be a real hazard for not only small mammals like hedgehogs, but also people, especially children. So make sure when you dig your pond that you have a slightly deeper area, but that it has an area for people and animals to get out of as well, a shallow area. We spent quite a bit of time digging out the ponds, making sure that we have a, a shallow kind of boggy area and also an area that's deeper. And we also spent a lot of time trying to remove as many stones as possible. Any sharp, jagged material, be it stones or brick or rubbish that's in the soil needs to be removed because over time it can push up and into the pond liner if you're using one and it can puncture it. And that's happened to me with the first version of my allotment pond and I had to take it apart and redo it the next year. So spend time like we did, remove as many stones as possible, rake them up, and then you can move on to putting in the liner. We did a, a little bit of an extra step though at the allotment, there have been a lot of people who have come and gone, and in the olden days, people used to use carpets to stifle grass and weeds so that they could lay it down and then come back and have essentially a blank canvas to work from. We have a lot of those old carpets left now. It is not recommended anymore to do that. Instead, use the black plastic like I showed you in last week's video if you want to do that. Going back to the carpets though, we had, we had all these old mucky carpets, years and years old, and instead of taking them to the tip, what we decided to do is to use them as a first liner or cushioning layer inside the pond. And so we collected them from around the site and then spread them out. And that will give a little bit more cushion. On top of those old carpets, we then put the underlay that we got from Pond Keeper, and it's a thick, soft material made of all different types of soft uh, lint-type fabrics and fibers, and it will give a really good cushion and support for the liner, which we then put on after. After spreading the liner over your pond basin, you can then fill it with water and tap water is perfectly fine to fill a pond with, but you do need to wait a good 24 to 48 hours afterwards before you start putting any kind of plants or animals into it, because that time really gives opportunity for the chlorine in the water to evaporate, so it'll be safe for animals and plants. Waiting that time, especially just a minimum of one day, is really important as well after you fill your pond with water because that liner will move and fill out and adjust itself to the contours of the pond within that day. And so when you lay the liner down, also ensure that there is a good amount of material all the way around the edges of the pond hole or basin that you've dug because part of that will pull down. Don't cut your liner just yet. Leave it until one to two days later when it has all settled. We're at the point now where I said phase one is complete. So we have a pond hole, it is lined and it has water in it. But as you can see, there is black plastic, very visible around the edges. There's no plants in the water. 
there is no sign of animals, although I have seen some robins and some curious animals kind of popping around the edges, checking it out. So we need to make it attractive for wildlife to want to move into. And so phase two is going to be all about digging in the edges of the plastic, trimming it back a bit, planting the edges with various types of plants. We also need to put some ponds, plants inside, and we also are going to kit this out with a pump, so a water pump and a fountain, which will help to aerate the water as well. I'll talk about that a little bit more in the next video on the ponds, but those are precautions to help ensure that the water stays oxygenated and clean and they are solar powered. And again, they were donated by Pond Keeper who have been amazing with helping to support the project here. So that will be all the fun bits. So adding all the plants and seeing what animals start to make themselves at home here. And by the summer, this pond is going to look completely different and I just cannot wait to see what moves in and how it impacts not only the wildlife and the biodiversity here on our site, but also as a focal point for everyone to enjoy. Thank you so much for watching. And if you've got any questions on the pond, leave them down below. And if you're new to Lovely Greens, don't forget, subscribe and click that little bell icon so you know when new videos are out. Thanks, and I will see you next week. And it is getting to the time where I am starting to sow some seeds. And so I think I shall make a video about some of the earliest seeds that I'm sowing right now and that you can also start as well. See you then.